Welcome to this edition of Healthline. I'm Dr. Kevin Soden. There are a lot of things we expect to lose as we get older, but you probably didn't think that your voice could be one of them. For singers and people who use their voice professionally, voice disorders can be especially troubling. Julie Andrews, Steven Tyler, and Cher have all gotten expert help to restore their voices. Or imagine one day you're an internationally syndicated radio personality. You love your job until you just can't get the words out. That's what happened to NPR host Diane Rehm. The Friday News Roundup with British murder charges for an ex-KGB agent. That's coming up this morning at 11 on The Diane Rehm Show. For over 20 years, award-winning radio host Diane Rehm has drawn top politicians as well as A-list entertainers. She is a voice to be reckoned with, but Diane Rehm has a voice disorder. <clears throat> Let me have a sip. Froggy, froggy. I usually have the shots every four months, and now I've gone for five months without one. So it just means clearing my voice when I have to. And, you know, sometimes it's uh, shaky and sometimes it's scratchy, but as it warms up, it gets better, which is why I go through all that stuff. That stuff is vocal exercises, and those shots are botulinum toxin, Botox, injected directly into the vocal cords. Thanks for joining us. I'm Diane Rehm. Iranian authorities say the U.S. is using critics and dissidents. A listener, perhaps tuning in for the first time, might say, my God, what is that woman doing on the air? WMU, this is the Diane Rehm Show. Did you call to be uh, on the air? Well, my voice began having problems in 1992. First noticed a tremor. And so once my engineer noticed it, I thought, well, got to do something about this, find out what's going on. So I must have gone to four or five different doctors here in Washington. They all kept saying there's absolutely nothing wrong with your throat. It's all in your head. Indeed, it was in her head, but not the way those doctors meant. I was forced to go off the air by my own choosing. I sounded like this. I could hardly get a word out. That's how bad it was. And then finally, my own doctor called my husband and said, we've got to get her to Johns Hopkins. We have to find out if she has throat cancer or Parkinson's or ALS or something. And that's when the neurologist and the otolaryngologist discovered in one hour that it was spasmodic dysphonia. I'll have to admit I had a little bit of a heads up uh, with respect to what was going on with her. My wife listens to Diane Rehm all of the time and she had asked me about the quality of her voice, said, you know, she sounds a little bit like the patients that you see. And clearly that was what was going on with, with Diane. There's no cure, but Botox injections unclamp the vocal cords the brain has mistakenly tightened. When I first wrote my book, Finding My Voice, the Today program came over to a film the whole process of receiving an injection. And the cameraman told me afterwards that he almost fainted when he saw the injection being given. As unpleasant as they are, Diane prefers the shots to the depression she suffered when she was off the air, literally silenced. When you cannot talk, you lose part of who you are. I was massively depressed and I sat in a chair in the living room for about four months thinking just that. It's over. You know, they can't find anything. Learning she had a neurological, not psychological problem was an enormous relief. 
it has a tremendous impact on a patient's life when they suddenly they can speak again in a comfortable voice and without that fear of, of what's going to come out next. Hilma Wallitzer is here to talk about her new book, and the title is Summer Reading. She began a campaign to educate her audience about spasmodic dysphonia and other voice disorders, sparing others the agony and uncertainty she endured. The likelihood of somebody going through what she went through has been dramatically reduced because physicians now think about Diane. They say, you know, you sound like that woman on the radio. And more and more patients come in to me having been told that someone's told them they sound like Diane Reem. Let's go to Scott in Dallas, Texas. Scott, you're on the air. Uh, good morning. It's really been quite a learning experience for me, and people tell me they now go to their doctors and say, I think I have what Diane Rehm has. So, I mean, I think more and more people now know about it. Thanks so much for joining Thank us. Thank you, Diane. I enjoyed it. Me Thanks too. for listening, everybody. I'm Diane Rehm. Now that's a class act. Diane Rehm is back and she's helped to spread the word on spasmatic dysphonia. We're here with Dr. Steven Zytels, Eugene B. Casey Chair of Laryngeal Surgery at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Zytels, welcome. Thank you. Um, Diane Rehm, you know, how common was it having a delay in getting diagnosed like that? With spasmodic dysphonia, it was not so uncommon for a number of years. Uh, there was less attention to the disorder when there wasn't a clear way to manage it or treat it. Um, in fact, the classic treatment uh, 20 years ago was actually to act, cut the nerve. And that was a pretty problematic thing because even though it solved the problem in a few people, it created bigger problems in others. And then when Botox came along, it was a godsend to these folks because many of them had become social recluses because of the of the tone and timbre of their voice was a bit grating to people. So it was wonderful, as, as Diane described, being able to re-enter what you love to do and re-enter society with this treatment. Sure. How common are voice disorders, whether it's spasmodic dysphonia or others like this in older people? Um, in fact, they're probably very common. And we accept uh, deterioration of the voice in the elderly as being part of the signature, the vocal signature of an older person. And in fact, very often they actually have solvable problems, sometimes even lesions, precancerous lesions, that have been there for at least a decade. But people accept it as being okay because it's not hurting, it's not causing bleeding, it's not uh, changing day to day, so they figure, ah, oh, I'm just getting old. And in fact, People do need to get checked. If they've been consistently hoarse, if people are asking them, are they sick, do they have a cold, they should have a laryngeal examination by somebody skilled near their home. Okay. When Healthline returns, we'll find out why even superstars need help with voice disorders. So please, stay tuned. Welcome back to Healthline. I'm Dr. Kevin Soden, and we're talking about voice disorders and other conditions affecting the larynx. We're here with Dr. Steven Zytels, director of the Center for Laryngeal Surgery and Voice Rehabilitation at Massachusetts General. You know, Diane Rehm had what we call a neurogenic type of voice disorder, but can you tell me what are the types of voice disorders? Well, neurogenic uh, voice disorders relate to there being an impairment with the nerves and how they make the vocal muscles move. Uh, there are a whole range and probably more common problems which the surface membranes aren't vibrating okay. properly. Are most of these disorders of the larynx or, or voice box caused by, let's say, overuse or wear and tear over time? Uh, we actually think that's probably the most common reason to have a voice disorder, and sometimes people get correctable lesions, polyps, nodules, and cysts, and other times the vocal folds after years of use, uh, especially in the aging population, they lose their pliability. You know, one of the things that I think about is that we, we talk about with older people, if you don't, you know, use it, you're going to lose it kind of thing. And we ask people to stay flexible, to stretch it. Can you do the same thing with your voice box? Well, you can actually do things to take care of it and, and, and not take it for granted, such as 
Um, be thoughtful when you have a respiratory tract infection, you're coughing a lot. If your voice doesn't come back, maybe to get checked because you actually have injured the vocal tissues. Um, we also ask people to keep very well hydrated, manage things like reflux. But at the end of the day, um, we believe over time in the future we're going to be able to reverse vocal aging. We envision that sometime, hopefully between three and ten years, they'll get an office-based injection with a pliable substitute and they will walk out of the office with a rejuvenated voice. Wouldn't that be exciting? Yep. And it immediately makes me think of people who are you know, singers and musicians. And I understand in your, in your clinic you've got a baby grand piano there? That's correct, yes. We, uh, we do work on a lot of singers. Um, it's just like a football player who would injure their knee. Uh, vocal folds get injured. Um, there's probably no part of the body that sees more trauma than the vocal folds. So if I speak to you at my normal male frequency of 120 hertz, it means they've collided 120 times in a second. Mm -hmm. So you can envision with seven or eight decades of use how many times your vocal folds have collided and why they tend to wear out. So let's talk about some of the big name stars or singers or musicians that you've, you've dealt with. Uh, sure. and maybe you can't, but it, I would think right away that these people are really using their voices all the time. Um, people went into Google, they would see, yes, I've worked with Julie Andrews and Cher and Denise Graves and these folks. Um, it's their success in their careers that's precipitated a lot of use. And I think it's actually great for some of these folks to be willing to talk about it because it's not because they don't know how to sing, it's because the show must go on and they'll use their voice just like a CEO, just like a professor, maybe even when they're ill because they have responsibilities vocally. Coming up, you don't need to be a famous star to have voice and larynx problems. Would you recognize a common symptom of laryngeal cancer? We'll tell you what to watch for after the break. Hi, welcome back to Healthline. I'm Dr. Kevin Soden, and we're talking about conditions that affect the voice. We've heard about a radio personality and some singers with major voice disorders. But what if you didn't sing? What if you were a lawyer like Doug McNutt, and one day your voice just started to go? How do you like your new job, Dad? Well, it's going pretty well. Five years ago, Doug McNutt wasn't sure he could keep his job, let alone get a new one. He was so persistently hoarse, his voice was nearly gone. I couldn't get the words out half the time. Normally when you're speaking, you think about what am I gonna say? But I was constantly not only thinking about what am I gonna say, but how do I get it out? I felt like I'd had a cold for a long time and my voice was scratchy and, you know, it was in the winter and, you know, okay, so I didn't think much of it. Gradually, he realized it was more than a cold. They told me that I had this stuff on my larynx and we tried a number of things. Doctors determined he had precancerous cells on his voice box, but their treatments failed. But I would constantly say, well, why don't we do something? I mean, why don't you get rid of this, you know? Uh, and uh, they just basically said that there wasn't anything they could do, that, that, you know, basically they would do the biopsies, make sure that it wasn't cancerous, and, and but uh, I was getting worse. It was a frustrating time for Doug and his family. Remember when I used to have to pound on the table in order to get people's attention because I couldn't talk? He headed to a top Boston center, but the news got worse. Although he had never smoked or abused his voice, Doug's precancerous condition had become cancer. Dr. Steven Zeitel is renowned for saving and restoring voices, especially elite singing voices like Julie Andrews. He says anyone whose voice is hoarse for more than three weeks should see a doctor. I think hoarseness can come at any age. The folks who are more likely to get precancerous or, or, or larynx or voice box cancer actually is an older population in general because we believe it takes a certain number of years for those tissues to genetically degenerate. The majority of people that we see with this problem go from their 50s through their 70s and increasing and probably peaking in the late 50s and 60s. Dr. Zeitel's treated Doug with surgeries, chemotherapy, and a new type of laser treatment he and his team had developed. What this new approach did was not only treat it more effectively in the operating room, we had a pathway to treat someone in 20 minutes under local anesthesia in the office and they can go to lunch. So I've done this to people who are over 90 
and they had no trouble with it whatsoever. Breathe through your nose. A flexible laryngoscope is threaded through the nose to view the voice box and vocal cords. So I'm going to pass the fiber through the same channel that we gave the local anesthesia. A fiber almost as thin as a human hair carries the laser down the same path. The technology, Pulse KTP Green Light Laser, it's the same one used to treat a baby's skin, so it's gentle enough for the delicate vocal cords. The green light of the KTP laser is absorbed easily into the blood. It works by reducing the blood supply the diseased tissue thrives on without harming the surrounding healthy tissue. So what we'll use is 15 one thousandths of a second. It briefly pulses it and only the blood heats for a moment and then it cools immediately so that the tissues around it don't get collateral heat damage or scar. Mr. McNutt, there's actually the, just about the smallest amount of disease and ages that we've seen. While he has no more signs of cancer, limited areas of precancerous tissue are an ongoing problem for Doug. So he's under constant surveillance, similar to a woman had a pap smear to check the cervix. And when we notice abnormalities, we treat it. And getting treated four or five times a year in the office is a lot easier. The difference in the OR is, of course, you, you, you're going under anesthesia. My wife would have to come down with me. I'd be here for a longer period of time. I'd have to go home. I have to do more significant voice rest. I usually was doing about a week of voice rest. So while it's not a cure, the laser keeps Doug's voice functioning normally. Say e e this has been a godsend for me. I mean, this has made all the difference in the world. Today, Doug's speaking voice is loud and clear, and he can count on being heard. Doug McNutt is healthy now, thanks to an expert laryngologist and a new laser treatment. We're here today with the man who helped heal him, Dr. Steven Zytels, director of the Center for Laryngeal Surgery and Voice Rehabilitation at Massachusetts General in Boston. Also joining us, the man who helps Dr. Zytels develop his cutting edge treatments, Dr. James Heaton of the Mass General Voice Center and Harvard Medical School. Doug's first symptom was hoarseness, mm -hmm. but is this always the case? If it's a vocal fold problem, it typically is, and vocal fold is synonymous with vocal cord. There's nothing different. So having hoarseness was, should have been a, a tip-off for anybody, really, sure. that persists over time, sure. is that right? The vocal folds are, are essentially a valve, and any type of lesion, and a lesion can be benign or malignant, it can be a polyp or a nodule, or in Doug's case, precancerous tissue, impairs the ability of the vocal folds to vibrate, and we hear that as a scratchy sound. Okay. Dr. Heaton, what does KTP stand for in terms of this laser? Well, the abbreviation stands for potassium titanyl phosphate, which is why we call it KTP for short. <laughs> I don't blame you. No. <laughs> and uh, what's special about this laser is that it's pulsed so that you can deliver uh, a lot of energy in a very short amount of time. And that lets you treat blood vessels specifically with the laser without, surrounding the, without affecting the surrounding tissue so much. Let me come to the precancerous lesions a little bit. What causes them? Are there certain risk factors that sure. would sort of tell people, hey, you better pay attention here? We think unequivocally that uh, smoking is probably the number one. It's very difficult to prove, but one of the ways one understands it is that white lesions, which is the standard result of precancerous tissue, they make keratin. Um, uh, they were not very common in the 19th century except in people who smoked pipes, which were the wealthy. It was primarily a 20th century phenomenon after the mass production of cigarettes. It sounds like then people 55 and older, you know, our, our audience here, would be at greatest risk because they're more likely smoking for a longer period of time. Not only are they smoking for a longer period of time, it takes a good 10 to 20 years very often for the genetic changes in the tissues to manifest themselves and morph. So it's not common at all to see precancerous lesions in people under 40. Yeah. When Healthline returns, what's on the horizon for voice and throat disorders? The latest treatments after the break. Welcome back to Healthline. I'm Dr. Kevin Soden. Well, let me ask you, we, we talked about precancerous lesions. How important is it to identify these early so that we maybe won't lead to cancer in the future? Uh, extremely important. Very few people, if they have their precancerous lesion treated, will evolve into cancer because you're catching it before it undergoes its final stage of malignant degeneration. 
the irony is most of the cancers that we treat were precancerous, many of them 10 to 20 years, so there was this window of opportunity that got missed. Dr. Heaton, what do you see in terms of lasers coming down the road? You've already made some remarkable progress over the last 15 years or so, but what, what do you see coming down in the future? Well, I imagine that they'll get more selective over time with how they interact with the tissues, so the surgeons will have uh, greater control. And with that control, they can um, choke off the blood supply to the, any abnormal tissues that might be forming on the vocal folds and thereby essentially get rid of what uh, shouldn't be there. Now, you're involved with some amazing research at Mass General, MIT, with a team of people. Mm -hmm. any, anything you see in the future that's really going to make a difference in our life, you think? Yeah, I think that um, much of the pharmaceutical in industry revolves around treating cancer, cardiovascular disease, pulmonary disease, things that are really dangerous to one's life. But in the meantime, if they're living longer, their vocal cords simply wear out. And we believe some of these strategies that we've already begun sort of selective trials in people who have lost the layer to cancer, and we're seeing some early successes. As this goes on, this will be a, a strategy and approach to actually make most hoarseness disappear. You have some last uh, advice for people who've had some voice changes that you'd like to give to them? Sure, I, I think it's very important to not accept an abnormal voice as part of a person's normal vocal signature. If it sounds wrong, if people are frequent.